slides, a lot of content. I want to get through half of it before you go to sleep. So today's presentation is about the money laundering canon, uh, which is my first experience on the consumer side as a security practitioner in almost 20 years. So it's pretty eye-opening for me. For some of you, this is probably old hat if you work in the banking industry. Uh, this presentation today is dedicated to my wife and son. They can't be here at DerbyCon today, or they can't actually come to the U.S. right now because of immigration issues. So hopefully they can watch this somewhere remotely. Love you both. Um, all right, our short agenda here today. I'm still learning to navigate this iPad, so bear with me. This is an experiment presenting from the iPad. So our short agenda today, I want to talk about what we built how we got attacked, and then the first anti-fraud model that we built, and then the successes and failures of that. We'll go on from there and we'll talk about the InfoSec product vendors we brought in to help us solve this more elegantly than our own in-house system. We'll talk about the continued attacks, some business risk modeling, then we'll talk about threat modeling, then we'll talk about the second generation system we built for anti-fraud after the vendor products didn't work for us. Uh, and then we'll talk about the conclusion, and then I'll let you all get out of here. And you'll be really happy this is over when we're done. But we'll try to keep it exciting, and I'll apologize up front. I like really cheesy and corny humor, and this is a dry subject since we're talking about banking and banking fraud. So I'm going to work some, hopefully, some amusement in here. At least eye rolling. All right, first thing off, I want to talk about you all before we get started to give us some context. How many people in the room are from the banking or fintech industry today? Oh, quite a few. Okay, this might be just a normal day in your life for you. This is pretty new for me. Do we have any CISOs in the room? Cool. Do we have any future CISOs, aspiring CISOs? <laughs> uh, blue team. How many blue teamers? Oh, awesome. Okay, how many red teamers do we have? Okay, even mixed today. That's pretty cool. Uh, do we have any anti-fraud people? One. Wow, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I should have said competent ones. Uh, any compliance people? Wow, okay, and you came to DerbyCon. That's cool. Finally, are any of you here by accident? This is your last chance to leave. <laughs> I won't take it personally. All right. Uh, I'm going to be your tour guide today, uh, and to give you some context, I started out as a breaker, but I had no intention of getting into information security. I became a builder and built in my 20s, which was uh, around the late 90s, turn of the century. I started building some early online banking applications, and just by virtue of being in the wrong time, wrong place, I met the Russians and Ukrainians and was part of the first organized crime coordinated SQL injection attacks against banks in the U.S. I was a target. So by virtue of the fact that I was one of the worst uh, developers and technical people on the team, they made me security guy, go figure out what the bad people are doing. So I got into InfoSec by accident. Um, in those early days, security products didn't work very well. So I thought, wow, maybe I should go build security products. I bet I can build a better mousetrap. So after I got out of banking, I spent about 15 years building security products, one of those vendor people uh, that you probably get annoyed by. Um, through my journey, though, I have concluded that data science and machine learning is where it at. She with the most data wins with some caveats. Big caveat being you have to know how to stitch it together. But a lot of what we do in security around rigid rules and compliance and all that, at the end of the day, um, I think data analytics solves a lot of this. Um, I'm trying to get out of cybersecurity desperately, as we'll talk about in this journey, but somehow I, I keep getting sucked back in. It's not my fault. So you're probably wondering, you know, security is pretty cool. It's really hot and sexy right now. Why would I go back to building a banking app after 15 years in security? Uh, and I'll give you some reasons. I spent 12 years in Silicon Valley. That's a soul-sucking place if you never lived there, which leads to a lot of debt. I do have a lot of stock. It's probably not going to be worth anything. And, of course, a lot of companies you work for, the options are priced, so mere mortals can't afford to buy them. Um, I've actually become disenamored with commuting five to six hours a day to the office. Uh, believe it or not. Um, and, and you can actually get burnout supporting sales teams. A lot of these startups, you have a lot of turnover. And believe it or not, not all the salespeople know a lot about information security uh, or your product or the customer or, or sometimes anything. But 
you know, you got to go to battle with the army you have to work with, and that can be, that can be very fatiguing, especially if you're a math-oriented person. Um, I also really needed a break from all you people. Nothing, nothing personal. Thank you for coming and listening today. So I wanted a break from InfoSec. Banking's where the real money is, right? It's like, enough of this InfoSec. Let's actually go make some real money and no more of your hacker bullshit, okay? I, I'm done. I'm out. I'm getting away from it. You all can hack all the things, and I'm going to go... I'm going to go make it rain. This was a year or two ago at DerbyCon. I have no idea how to get the audio working here. But um, if you heard the audio, it's even funnier. Someone in the background is shouting for Trevor. <laughs> OK, so how are we doing on time check? I had a double espresso and some MCT oil before I started here. So uh, if I'm a little scattered seeming, it's because I am. All right. so. So day one at the job, I'm fresh, I'm new, I'm excited. I might as well be in my early 20s, you know. I'm all like doe-eyed, walking in, this is going to be fun. We're going we're gonna to build this awesome payments platform and make a lot of money and all go retire and never see a hacker again. Um, and I'm going to give you a plot spoiler. That's not actually how it worked out. So what did I find out day one on the job? Um, this company had already been around for a little while, and they had already built a first-generation product that didn't make any money. So they pivoted, and they built a first-generation payments platform, and that, that's when I joined. They're in the process of, of starting to build a second-generation payments platform. So what I discovered the first day I came in on the job is that, that we were actively being exploited by what would turn out to be organized crime. And so day one on the job, we're losing serious cash. Now, when you're, when you're a revenue crunch startup with a finite runway, losing a lot of cash is actually a pretty bad thing. Um, it means that horizon you have, you know, I got 24 months to live, you just watch that kind of tick away every minute. Uh, we also had a lack of something, which, which a lot of you are probably familiar with in InfoSec. We didn't have any information security, cybersecurity, or AppSec staff anywhere in the organization, startup. Um, but that's okay. We didn't actually need them because we didn't have any tools either, so they didn't have anything to run. Um, and, and we also didn't have any budget. So even if we had them, they probably wouldn't have stayed because we wouldn't have paid them. But I found out another thing pretty quickly. This is a little one that turned out to be really important. Uh, when they built this payment platform, they didn't build any mechanism to like log user actions or administrative actions or customer support actions. So there really weren't any logs. And when you're trying to understand how you're losing money and what bad people are doing to you, I found out logs are pretty important. And I just throw this in for, for humor. Um, I did talk to the CEO about this, having a background in security. You know, I said, hey, you know, there's some things we might want to consider doing here. And he gave me a five grand budget so that we could go out and do a pen test on our infrastructure and applications. Um, and now that might seem a little small, but the good news is we didn't have any test or QA region. Everything was just live in production. So the environment was smaller than, you know, a lot of enterprises. Um, and, but, you know, when you have five grand to work with, I just did not spend all that money. So basically I got some Qualys and ran it. And after that, I said, I, eh, probably not even worth my time. Um, kind of people I can hire for that remaining three grand don't even speak English. They're probably the people stealing money from us. So, so that was pretty good. Um, it's, it's only going to get worse. This is a guy that told me I might have to leave in the middle of your presentation. Um, so, so what is it that we actually built? probably should understand that before we talk about how they attacked us. What we built was a, a payments platform based upon using physical or virtual cards. So the goal was to have a dynamic cash management platform. In other words, to manage cash dynamically, kind of like you do credit. So, you know, let's say you have an employee at DerbyCon and she runs into one of your customers and wants to take him to lunch. She can dynamically tell accounting, hey, I need 200 bucks to go to lunch. Or let's say she has an emergency. 
she needs a hotel room or something like that. There's different ways you can dynamically allocate funds. So you can sort of streamline your cash management and rationalize it, make it sane, transparent throughout the organization. We also built a credit system, um, but we never got that launched because we wound up with our hands full with cash. And we also learned, if it's not a lot of you from this space, but it's so incredibly regulated today. It's not like when I started 20 years ago that the idea of marrying cash and credit turned out to be incredibly daunting from a compliance standpoint. So the transaction processing used the credit rails. If you're familiar with the credit network, this wasn't a debit play. Um, so we had physical and virtual cards running over the rails and it all essentially would look like a credit SKU transaction. Who was the target market? It was organizations that either cannot get credit uh, for their organization of the size that they need to execute their business or they don't want the liability of giving credit to all their employees, people like you here at DerbyCon. Um, and they don't want to give them all credit cards and let them run around with hackers and have their credit abused. So key features of the application. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this. There actually were some O days that we found from the design flaw perspective. May talk a little bit about later, but the key thing to understand is there's three ways to put money into the system. You have to get money into the system to get money out of the system. So first way would be an ACH push. For those of you not familiar with ACH, it's the mechanism by which you move money from a checking account into another account, bank account to bank account transfer. And ACH is a domestic mechanism. So you can go to your bank account and push money into your vault. The vault would be a, uh, an FBO, a for benefit of bank account that we would manage for you. So our platform manages FBO accounts. You could push money, very few people did that. More common mechanism would be to pool money. You set up a scheduled pool. Every time I run low or once every two weeks, transfer X amount of money into my vault. And then we added credit cards because we had a hypothesis that people like to double dip. I mean, everybody in here probably has a credit card. They get some points or cash back. And then we would partner with retail people that would also give bonuses. So that means the consumer can now double dip on her card. You know, I get points for loading my vault. And then I also get additional discounts on top of it. So credit card became the primary mechanism by which people put money into our platform. So what actually happens? Let me catch up with my notes here. All right. Turns out there's some bad people out there. Oh. <sighs> I know I'm kind of ruining this by jumping ahead that you were wondering what the rest of this was going to be about. All right. So, so what happened? One interesting thing that happened is that I, years ago when I worked at White Hat, I put together a presentation or worked with the team. We put together a presentation on, on not just how people were compromising things, but I wanted to understand how bad people were making money. You know, it always goes back to some incentives. And I thought if, if we can understand the incentive models better for bad people, we can build better testing tools to emulate them better if we understand what their end game is. And it looked very suspiciously to me after studying a lot of bad guy, you know, after action reports that they must have had some kind of active monitoring in place. So I wasn't on the detection side, but it really seemed that way. And it turned out that was true. So we had bad people. And interestingly enough, these did not appear to be technically sophisticated people. We had bad people monitoring our software for changes somehow. I do not know what the mechanisms were because it goes back to that whole thing about logs, visibility, but there somehow they were monitoring us. Now, in the beginning, the hypothesis was they were monitoring things like press releases. We announced a new release, a new version. A new, so we stopped doing that to do some experiments. They were still catching us when we would make major changes, even to things under the hood that were not visible. Not quite sure how, but they were there. And what they were catching were insufficient and broken controls. For all I know, it was brute force. You know, uh, it could be, you know, first time fraud Fred sitting in his parents' basement and just logging in every night and checking the address validation routine. I, I don't know for sure. Um, how did they compromise us? The 70% is by by loss, actually. So the type of breaches that led to loss, about 70% of our financial losses came from exploits of weak business logic. In other words, um, we allowed the 
adversarial fraudster to do bulk account creation. We didn't have very good throttling and we had no throttling and fingerprinting and controls in the beginning. So an adversary with automation and they were creating bots, they would go in and register, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of accounts. Once they had those accounts registered, they would start seeding them with credit cards. That was the primary mechanism. Once they would seed them with credit cards, then they would do bulk attempts at doing name and address validation against those credit cards, typically with microtrial-ish transactions. So they would run through and try to do all these little small transactions until they got matches and hits. So we had this very high frequency, low pulse activity until they get a match and then your pulse uh, well, it actually wouldn't skyrocket. It would stair step. I really, for various reasons that I can't disclose yet, I can't, I wanted to show raw data with charts so you could see the patterns of behavior, but there's some data I just can't disclose yet because there's more stuff going on around this, but I think you get the idea. So, so once they found a valid hit, they wouldn't then do a hundred grand load. They would do like a one grand, five grand, 10 grand, and they would stair step their way up until they exhausted that funding source, um, probably for some logical reasons. So what was the other part? Well, the other part was interesting because have any of you been to a security conference before? Okay. How many of you consider yourselves technically competent hackers? Wow, that's a small show of hands. Okay. I would have, I would have thought I'd seen more. Well, you know, at the, at the, it's been in vogue over the years, especially at Black Hat and some of that, to make fun of people who just do like social engineering type testing and poo-poo social engineering. Well, they're not really that technical. That's not that important. They're not real hackers. They're not real security people. But they did get about 30% of the revenue that we lost. So I take social engineering a lot more seriously today. Uh, how did they social engineer us? Well, the system was designed to have controls be configurable down to a per entity account level and this is a, with no ability to audit or have visibility over this and that's a horrible design so essentially what happened is level two support was able to go in and reconfigure or turn off controls security controls velocity controls monetary controls they could manipulate or turn them off without anybody anywhere in the organization knowing the people who figured that out were the fraudsters so the fraudsters, after we would, later as we get into the anti-fraud systems, when we'd automatically detect and shut them down, the charismatic ones would get on the phone with some amazing sob story and emergency, and then the next thing you know, they've grabbed another 50 grand and, and run with it. So what exactly, why didn't we respond to that more quickly when that sort of thing would happen? Again, logs. The final one that was interesting, we did have technical phishing attacks. Uh, I couldn't find any evidence that we lost money due to them. So we had email phishing and Google fake apps. And the final honorable mention, if you're trying to build and defend your environment in this kind of a situation, our payments platform, we tried to ma maintain strong authentication and connectivity to partners, to various networks, and to internal components. So we worked very rigorously to have strong certificate-based authentication and strong certificate-based encryption. We had no mechanism to inventory and monitor all those certificates, both our own and with partners. So we continually denial of service ourselves as certificates would expire or partners would change them without that management visibility. And that, that definitely had real revenue impact. All right, so we built a payments platform that we discovered was a money laundering cannon. One more time, Kelly at the Hyatt Bar, just because this is so fun. We built that, we thought for us, but we actually built that for the bad people. All right, so what is the money laundering cannon? The money laundering cannon was a platform for exfiltrating value off of stolen accounts, plain and simple. It's actually pretty hard with a lot of today's consumer prepaid systems to exfiltrate money in mass of the size and volume that we saw and enabled because not many of them work in the mechanism. Nobody's really built a prepaid cash stored value like enterprise system the way that we had. So how did it work? Well, the adversary steals either checking account or credit card info. They load said info into the platform we built. 
Then, as we discussed, they go through and they attempt to do brute force matching. This is all pretty noisy stuff that we should have been able to detect, but this is in the empathy again. So they go through, they do brute force matching, um, and as soon as they get a hit and they know they have a name and address match, we thought full name and address match, this would turn out not to be correct later. Um, as soon as they find that, then what is the exfiltration mechanism? Well, we quickly locked down purchasing gift cards. That's pretty obvious. We locked out making purchases over the internet. That's pretty, we actually did that. That was one of the very first things done. I've seen that fraud over and over again. So the top three items, I, I forget what they were off the top of my head, but number two of the top three were, uh, anybody want to take a guess what they were buying? Nests, amazingly, were really popular. So this has been about a year and a half ago. So essentially what we figured out the profile was, was small, high dollar items that can quickly be sold on a street corner or on eBay for a pretty good cash return value was what they would go out and try to buy. The smaller and higher dollar, the better. Key being it has to be fairly liquid. Um, and then of course we had to eat these. We didn't have any warranty models, so we're eating the credit card chargebacks. And the other thing I learned, there's two types of ACH. There is personal or consumer and business ACH. Uh, business ACH has a 48 or 72 hour return window. So you're usually pretty safe for fraud. Consumer by law has a 60 day window that if it's disputed, you have to give the money back. You're just done. So we were using consumer ACH. So on ACH, we just get hosed. So that's what we built and what happens if you build it. All right, so we didn't get a lot of sleep in the beginning and we had about 72 hours at the burn rate. We were watching the adversaries that we figured we needed to get something in place or we weren't gonna be in place. So we hacked together an anti-fraud system that was really crude, really ugly, but it's what we had to do. We didn't really have any options. So what did we do? Um, the first thing we did was put in spending velocity limits. We started at 24 hours. We later shrank that to 12 hours um, just because of impact to legitimate users. We noticed legitimate users, you know, maybe you buy something after work and then the next day you're like, oh, I need one more. One of the retail models would be like contractors we'd service. 24 hours would artificially suppress their behavior to a point where they just abandon the product. So we had to go to 12 hours. Our theory was by putting in velocity limits, we'd still limit the ability to use stolen cards. Our hypothesis was they have about a 72 hour lifespan at max, and it actually seemed to be a lot shorter for a stolen credit card. Uh, the second thing we put in, you know, I've heard the mantra for years that blacklists don't really work. I heard a lot of people in security say that, and they actually do work really well. So we got a really cheap blacklist. MaxMind is like the super, uh, poor man's data set compared to like, you know, a, a risk IQ or something like that. Actually with MaxMind's data, so their geo data is really kind of messy, but their, their min fraud data, which is essentially known bad actor names and known bad card accounts, uh, for the fraud that we had that successfully got through, we ran it through their system and we got about a 94% hit rate and we didn't have any false positives and we said, well, Shit, that's good enough, let's do it. So we implemented MaxMind really quickly. Um, we made another change as well with our retail partners. We said, we quickly whipped together some software and said, when you're opening a new account, if you want to transact in volume, you have to go to a retail location where we know they have CCTV and the fraudsters know they have CCTV and you have to present an ID to a human who will key it in uh, to another interface of ours. There's no real confirmation. It all could be faked pretty easily, but the idea was we get rid of some of the, the fraudsters that were first time fraudsters, the low hanging fruit. And so long story short, we shotgun controls. To this day, we really don't know which controls work, but it did deter fraud. We basically squashed fraud for about six months. So our fraud went from you know, bleeding really badly to basically zero after we put these three controls in place um, for exploiting the application. The fraud pressure then shifted to social engineering, our level two support. But so we squashed that initial vector, but here's what became problematic. We constantly had to juggle trying to figure out how to enable our users to use the product successfully, or we didn't make money, with enabling the fraudsters to steal the money, and then in which case we didn't have any money. So either way, we were going down this rabbit hole that leads to no money. Um, and 
by making these changes very rapidly, it's almost impossible to keep up with all the design and flow of your software. So our user experience was awful for the users. They would conclude that things were bugs when they'd run into these limits. They wouldn't understand the messages. Things might, we might change things overnight. Um, we also, the product behavior, because of these security changes, didn't match any of the training that our partners and customers got. It didn't match the documentation. Our support became overwhelmed. You know, we're little startups. We have a small support team, and they got completely crushed by this. They weren't trained. They weren't prepared. So our, our support times rubber banded. Um, and, and all this resulted in increased user abandonment. So the more we dialed in security, the more we lost people giving us money or the whole reason we're there in the first place. So... What did we do about that? Well, we said, okay, there's got to be commercial vendors that can solve this for us and make this all go away, and then we can focus on making money. And the challenge we had was pretty interesting. Um, when we brought in vendors, there was usually a fairly significant lack of comprehension of the platform we build and how it worked. Makes sense. We built something fairly unique, and we were bringing something unique to market. But the vendors didn't really take the time to understand, vendors would focus on their capabilities and not actually understanding what our problems were. Um, and so as someone who spent 15 years building security products for potentially people like you, this was a pretty sobering experience to be on the consumer side, trying to wade through all these vendors and their salespeople. Um, I inherited a partial implementation of SIF Science, which we're gonna come back to later. Um, at the time, though, SIF Science was less mature. I think they were a younger company. Uh, the implementation, we couldn't make it work. There was not enough data to train the models, their machine learning models, to get them to accurately detect anything and, and not just generate noise. And every time that we tried to get it working, they would be like, oh, you need one more piece of data. And so we'd add this new thing and be like, okay. And they'd be like, oh, you need this other thing. Oh, you need this SDK. Oh, yeah. I was finally like, guys, like, this is like, I'm not in business to implement SIF science. Like, you clearly don't have your act together you're out. So we booted SIF Science out. Um, and the other thing that was kind of fun is a lot of vendors came in and told us what we should be focused on. That was great when security vendors were telling us what our business case should be. The other thing was, is there was a natural tendency to focus on the software itself. My background is AppSec and software security. I get it. You know, my problem isn't that I, I need a dynamic web app scanner. We were building a state-of-the-art modern app. There isn't a web app scanner out there I know of today that actually works with and interacts with the DOM competently. I mean, I, I worked and built DOM-based scanners. I know their challenges and limitations. They just don't work, especially with React-type technologies. Uh, automated scanning on mobile is pretty pointless. Um, because really when you say mobile, what I mean are APIs, and modern APIs don't lend themselves to dynamic scanning. Source code scanners didn't support our stack well, and they didn't support a fast, continuous release DevOps type environment. Um, web app firewalls, we already had everything behind proxies, so I don't need the rudimentary WAFing capabilities. And the web app firewalls themselves didn't really have the logic or context to help with the ways we were losing money. Um, what we needed was solutions for a real threat model. So I had to dig back into my past years ago when I used to do threat modeling, and we'll come to that next. First, I want to give you, so the, I want to talk about the vendors briefly. So where do you begin with the vendors? So it turns out Gartner had a magic quadrant for this, but I didn't find it at this time. And the reason why is because I, the, the magic quadrant is not named vendors that will help you stop bad people from stealing your money. That's what I kept searching for. Um, so it's online fraud detection systems. But when you start out, the problem is kind of complex and hard to define. And, and the vendor technologies are significantly different. I mean, they all use the same machine learning and AI and super, you know, they all have the same buzzwords. But the reality is, is, is what they consume and produce and analyze is, is pretty different. Um, I had a real struggle getting the vendors to give me anything concrete. I'd say, I want to talk to your data science team. I want to know what algorithms you are using or laying on top of each other and how in your supervised learning model. Like, I want to understand how it learns and what the gaps are. I want to understand what it's interacting with. And they just simply wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Um, and I, I suspect a lot of them didn't know, and those people are probably pretty busy, but most of them didn't have documentation. So I deduced basically what you really need to understand you need to know exactly what your problem is, which requires a fair bit of technical competence. You also, once you understand the problem, 
Um, so you can go to these vendors and say, this is exactly what I'm trying to solve. I have these three things. I have these five things. If I don't solve for these right now and these thresholds, I'm out of business. Demonstrate to me how you're going to solve them and I don't need a three-month freaking POC or I'm out of business. Um, so you need to know exactly what you're doing. Second of all, you have to make them show you because you need to make sure you have the right staff and skill to handle it. We found some technologies that had promised to solve these things, but they required tremendous overhead from staff that, as we already covered, didn't exist. So if I bought them, what's, what's the point? We can't use them anyway. Um, I mean, I already was sleeping like by this point, like three hours a night. Uh, the last thing I needed was another widget with knobs. Um, these things aren't like firewalls. You don't turn them on and say, okay, I'm going to limit egress to this pool of whatevers. So if you're in this space, though, one thing that I found useful is uh, Aviva Gartner is one of my favorite Gartner analysts. She wrote this five layers of fraud back in 2011. Now, the vendor references are totally outdated, and some of the technology references are outdated, but conceptually, your five layers of fraud makes a lot of sense. I'd love to see that modernized for 2018. I found that Gartner put out a new report. Aviva's no longer part of that team, it appears, but Gartner put out a new 2018 report on this, but it's 1300 bucks, and I didn't have 1300 bucks to spend uh, when I, I just found that report more recently. Um, so... So you need to understand exactly what your problem is. We understood that. And, and, and then we got into what are the data sets that you can potentially use to stop this problem. And this is what we boiled down, myself and the data science team, to the data sets we need to analyze. And, you know, we don't have time in the talk today to get more granular. But it, it, initially, you know, you need some blacklists. Now, there's dangers with false positives and blacklists, but you can get a lot of mileage out of weeding out noise from blacklists. And blacklists can be... You know, I'll call them machine learning generated like emailage. Blacklist can be reputational based, known bad. You need device fingerprinting. Device fingerprinting is a freaking gold mine. I mean, you know, it, it's probably going to be fairly uncommon for an iPad to be running a headless browser with a high degree of automation. It's probably, I'm probably not going to Chromecast my big screen TV to do my online banking. So screen resolution, there's all sorts of things you can fingerprint from a device that you, and, and if so, make them log in again or combine these. So these things in and of themselves can be problematic to decision on. I should know my wife and I, uh, my wife gets locked out in the third world all the time. Every time she changes a SIM card and we're using the same pans, Airbnb or somebody decides we're fraudulent and locks all her shit out really quickly. It's a nightmare because they're like, uh-oh, SIM changed, pan reuse, boom, done. Right? But if you combine these and stack them, you can start to make intelligent decisions. Behavioral fingerprinting, which I see this term starting to use behavioral biometrics. I'm not really sure what it means, but to me it means, you know, hey, your spidey senses should be tingling in plus one when there's a change to an account. When payment methods change, in plus one. Uh, you see spinning patterns like size, velocity, and geo. Uh, changes to those are an in plus one. Uh, customer support. In talking to security vendors and other people in the field, I saw a lack of instrumentation and monitoring out of obvious tools like Zendesk. Customer support is an obvious target. 30% of our revenue, the money we lost through social engineering was probably three headcount to engineers or security people that could have helped us solve this problem. So if you instrument and grab that data of support activity and match it up, inbound, outbound phone calls, things like this, and it's actually fairly trivial to do. Um, so I'm going to call those the transparent data sets. You don't need to interfere with the user's life to combine these and start making decisions about whether it's really the user uh, or someone doing bad things or a bot, etc. Then you have invasive things. Invasive things are, I find, to be much more accurate, but they also will call abandonment in, of your product because they cause user friction. So there's a lot of new vendors out there that do digital ID and face verification. That technology is getting pretty mature. It's pretty robust. It's a little annoying, but the big folks like Airbnbs, the world are starting to use it. There are more vendors out there starting to do dynamic audio and video verification. That's very robust. But when I said she with the most data wins, there's only a handful of people that have the capability to do that robustly. And those little vendors are partnering with them. It's people like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and China. I don't recommend partnering with China on this, but they do have the biggest CCTV network in the world. Uh, so they're going to get way ahead of everybody at this. Uh, and then the final one is out of wallet questions. They're really annoying and high friction, but they do work well. So this was the short list. We looked at more vendors. I'm going to give you a quick SWAT, and then we're going to roll through and wrap this up. Um, I looked at Datavisor. They're an unsupervised ML platform. 
Um, you have to get them the data. They don't have any drop-in SDKs. It's not all shrink wrap for you. Um, I really just, I mean, basically they told me that I didn't understand machine learning and stats and that kind of turned me off. So that conversation didn't go anywhere. Uh, early warning systems is one of the oldest vendors that's been around. They do some ACH fraud. I could not get out of them what they do. So I finally gave up on that. Um, we wound up using Certigy, which is an FIS fork corporation. They use some kind of ML. Uh, I'm going to put it on the level of magic. It's about the detail I could get out of them because their story kept changing. Um, I don't know if it works or not, but it doesn't matter because Certigy gave us a warranty model. Boom, done. I got bigger things to worry about. So they warranted the transaction. As long as we get them the right data, warranty and move on. I like that model. I'm going to skip forward for now. SIF Science came back. We brought them back in. Uh, and by early 2018, their UI had matured, but more importantly, their API, their API docs, and all their technical docs had vastly matured. You can actually understand what the hell's going on, what their APIs are, what you need, how to implement it, and their people were on the ball. If they'd had that two years ago, we might have not been having this discussion because we would have implemented them and probably used them pretty heavily. Uh, but that wasn't the case when we did it. A little too little too late on their side. Threat metrics is one of the older and the most mature in terms of data sets and analytics. Usability is where threat metrics fell apart. You manage it like a firewall. So somebody has to understand mobile device technical details. Somebody has to understand fraud. Somebody has to understand geo and combine all these rules and then manage them all. When you start screwing up your legitimate users, start causing problems and abandonment. So not only do you not have the staff, but the skill set you need is an unusual hybrid. It's like you're going to need a team of hybrid people. And I actually went around and started calling threat metrics customers because I noticed an increasing number also were having JavaScript widgets for SIFT and Forder, and as I called people up, people were telling me off the record, like, yeah, we don't really use them. Um, and finally, Forder. Forder is like the poor man's civ science in terms of a you user experience and do it yourself. Where they're superior is they essentially offer it as a, a, a managed service under a shared risk or a full warrantied risk model, which in the case of a little startup at risk of going under with no staff, that's brilliant. So it's kind of expensive, which is relative when you're at risk of going out of business. Um, but when you can take that model where you can either share risk or give them a percentage of profit of transactions and then they'll warranty all the transactions in return for doing the fraud, that's actually kind of brilliant. I was surprised more people didn't do that. So what was the outcome of this? Well, like I said, we squashed some of the behavioral stuff. We looked for vendors to help us out. We struggled. We continued to have problems around attempted phishing. Level one support had never got anywhere. We had them pretty well sandboxed, network, device, and VM. Uh, technical fish didn't appear to be successful. Google, of all things, caught some fish and told us. So we were using Google Apps. Google would actually email me and say, oh, we caught and stopped that. That was a new one for me. I didn't even know they did that sort of thing. Um, we talked about social engineering by fraudsters. Level one support, they couldn't really do much because the level one support didn't have good tooling, which was actually really bad for the business. To do it again, I would give level one support a lot more capability. Uh, level two support, we talked about how they would get owned. Level two support also had no infosec training, objectives, or accountability. Understandably, a small team hired for empathy and a startup to take care of your whale customers, but there, weren't, there wasn't any training, anything, awareness around that, and without it, you know how that story went. So, speculative risk modeling. So the really smart financial people, and these people were way smarter than me and way better at math, they put together a model to see if we could understand the impact of our security control and restrictions on user spending behavior. Is security causing us to fail? Essentially, how much can we relax security while making money? So they put together these really cool models and calculated it all out, and it was all well and good. It was interesting discussions, but honestly, it, it was super educational for me because we instrumented our users and really tried to understand what they were trying to do. We understood how they spent money and moved through the system in every possible way. But the problem with those models is that we didn't have any data on which controls were effective and effective to what degree. So any discussion around control efficacy and cost is kind of silly when you don't have any data on them. It's all speculative. So how do you know which controls are mitigating justified needed you don't know? We fraud frequency data was speculative because we ramrodded controls in and took it to zero. So we don't know what our potential fraud is. We didn't have the data. We didn't have the logs, right? So we didn't have historical data. We also didn't have a strong understanding 
of what pulse would be when we relax controls. So if we allow someone to fund and spend more, does that raise pulse of single events for fraud? Don't know, don't have the data. So without better data, what decision do you make? Well, benefit versus loss is wildly speculative. So I guess you gotta bet on winning. I mean, nobody shows up to try not to lose. If you do, you're probably in the wrong game. But the risk is, could you lose it all in one day? So that's the question. So that's the question we're gonna try to answer here. Some other flaws in the business model. Um, because we uncovered that fraudsters were using automation to create users and manipulate our system, I believe that a significant amount of data in our system was junk or fraudulent data. But all our business models and financial models were built on these potential users that we hadn't converted or capitalized on spending. So our business models themselves potentially were way off. We don't know, but we know adversaries were in there auto-generating a lot of this stuff. We didn't have and implement any data quality services. I couldn't convince anyone that was a good thing. There's cheap services like Melissa Data to just verify our address is real, properly formatted. People use them for different reasons, but a reason, but I wanted to go back and scrub everything, all our historical data through like a Melissa Data, MaxMine, reputational blacklist, to just get a sense was what was our junk level? And one of the execs had come from a background at one of the big credit card companies, and he said, well, it's, it, industry average is 0.05% junk. And that's fine when you have huge teams of InfoSec and anti-fraud people, and you have anti-bot technologies and all this shit that's, that's keeping all the scrapers and automation out. We didn't have any of that, right? So industry standard might be 0.05, but were we 1%, 5%, or 50% junk? I'll never know. So my hypothesis is that our business model projections by which we made our risk calculations are potentially exponentially flawed um, and scrubbing basically part of the reason that I think there was an aversion to scrubbing is when you're running out of money and you need to raise money. This is why Twitter, I think, didn't kill their bots for years. When you're trying to tell a growth story, the last thing you want to do is turn someone loose to scrub that data and go, oh yeah, 50% of our growth is bullshit. Let's kill that off, by the way. <laughs> Please give us a you know, $5 million check. It's not going to happen. Um, so I started simple with an alpha threat model. We had three tiers of users, and we basically said, who are our adversaries, what are their capabilities, and how do they target each of these tiers? So this is how we set out to solve this problem with a rudimentary threat model. I'm a big fan of threat modeling. Uh, we could only get so far with that. So then we unpacked it, and basically the structure I took for a threat model is I started, on the left you have the threat vector. Um, and then from threat vector, we go to attack surface. What is the attack surface they're targeting? What is their action and intended outcome of the adversary? What are the mechanisms we can use to detect it? And finally, what are the controls or compensating controls we can implement? So we got down and dirty and modeled everything out. We're at a five minute check and I'll try to wrap this up. So remember when we launched this, still no test region, live code is live. Turned out we had fraudsters in the system who had registered, never done any fraud, and gone dormant. And they wait for us, waited for us to launch our Gen 2 product, and then they struck immediately. And we didn't even announce this. They were off to the races in hours. Um, they found we made some mistakes. We had a developer, Holy War, you know, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, about API naming, um, that that stupid holy war led us to use some wrong APIs, which, which got us some chargebacks. We also found out that one of the major credit card vend validation vendors out there only verifies the integers and the strings for all the customer information. So if you have an address, a zip code, all that, they only verify the integers and nothing else. That was pretty sobering. Um, so time for some data science. Um, I, I don't know if I'll publish all this online. There's a lot of stuff here. We're running out of time. I just wanted to give you an idea how we modeled all this out. So, so things that might be of interest here. This is a lot of thresholding. We basically, you know, don't use machine learning if you can do it with a SQL query or some R. Start with some stats and then build your machine learning later to find your clusters and get your thresholds dial in and then automate it all. That's what I'm here to say. So for example, the 500 mile rule, if I have a funding event, and a spending event with a delta of 500 miles in sub five hours, either that's a whale customer with a really nice private jet or something fraudulent's going on, assuming my data is good. So we basically built out all these models. What are some other ones? These are all thresholding uh, that generated rules, spending behaviors. We also put some in around customer support. If we see changes to account initiated by customer support, 
um, you know, were there inbound phone calls? Were there outbound phone calls? Was support compromised? Is support being social engineered? You can stitch all that together to start generating alerts and you can start looking for either abusive employees or people in controls that have been subverted. Um, we got into behavioral anomaly detection, so you can do some basic thresholding. When, when you see changes in behavior in your system, you have to ask yourself, did the world change or did your system change? Hey, I had a spike of 25% increase in user enrollment. What changed? Oh, we just completely revamped our authorization model uh, during enrollment. Yeah, probably want to look into that like immediately. Spidey sense is massive tingling. So what was the outcome from all this? Well, we stitched together a system that worked really well using our own data science team. We put these rules in place. We actually squashed fraud. Uh, the tolerance was zero, which is unrealistic. We took it to zero. Um, it was a little too late. Uh, I outsourced the risk for CC and ACH. No role for me in product security. So. Um, user growth didn't match needs so my journey came to an end as did a lot of other people uh, during this period are we at the two minute okay um, so so let me just recap here we'll try to end on a little higher note um, so again i took a break from cybersecurity infosec i took a break to make some money reclaim personal time i have a nice peaceful life and i didn't mention this in the beginning but we uh, uh our son was kidnapped and we wanted some more bandwidth to try to find him as well uh, hard to do when you're working long hours at a startup. What were the results? Well, the results is I didn't escape the gravity well. Back into InfoSec from day one. Uh, it turned into, you know, seven days a week, sometimes 15-hour days. Uh, got to where I was barely sleeping at night. By the way, if any of you have sleep apnea, I run into a lot of people in this community do. I left it untreated for years. Uh, I finally got a CPAP during that period, and I think that's the only way I survived. Um, during this period, during this year of battle with the adversaries, my wife and I were flagged for marriage fraud and had to go down the Stokes and uh, deportation interviews. We finally beat that. Uh, we, we had trouble with kidnappers and legal system and law enforcement overseas. All went dark on us. I taught my wife to use phishing. Uh, we set up social media accounts and we started phishing our adversaries. Uh, we took up the hunt in person overseas and we actually got our son back uh, in February. <laughs> If you've known me for a long time, you know I'm a pretty horrific prankster and some of them have been pretty mean. So I think the Cosmic Coincidence Control Center gave me one hell of a bunch of paybacks this year all at once. So the lessons I learned, whatever you build is going to get broken. These are pretty obvious and given. Logs are really important. Uh, but design it up front with good, robust logging. Fraudsters are eternally vigilant. Even the non-technical ones are vigilant. They're going to monitor and test you all the time. Low-tech social engineering can screw you. Technical attacks are actually mostly a non-issue, and I see a lot of security teams sweat that a lot if you're not dealing with the simple stuff. Uh, monitor everything. The stuff you need to monitor for user performance, user onboarding, all that data can be used to build a very robust security system to squash your fraudsters. And you can read the bullet points. I don't have to call them all out. Business lessons. Business doesn't care about security. That's your job. The business cares about job sec. If there's no jobs in the job sec, there's no info sec, right? User and customer experience is sacred. The more security interfered with users, the less money we had. It was just as bad as the fraudsters. But the cool thing is the data analytics used to optimize for users you can use to build out. Uh, machine learning to me is just patterns at scale and speed from stats. AI is just making better decision trees. It's nothing fancy in my humble opinion. Final life lessons, and I'll let you go today. Thank you for your time. It's just a job. Stuff you own doesn't matter. It's people that matter. So never miss a moment to be thankful. Thank you. Any questions?